Welcome to The Alchemist Show. I'm Justin Brewer, talking about Cinematic Universe with Mr. Cook. To continue where we left off on our examples, um, the second to last example I have is the Unbreakable Universe with Unbreakable, Glass, and Split, which all three were directed by M. Night Shyamalan, which I believe it was an original idea, and a bit of surprise that they were all a Cinematic Universe with the ending of Split revealing that it is a bit a surprise sequel to Unbreakable. And it did not do very well when it hit the when Glass hit theaters. And for my next example, the Lord of the Rings universe, which could mainly the Peter Jackson films with the trilogy for Lord of the Rings and then The Hobbit with a new show coming up on Amazon soon set in the have in the same universe. And uh, just to show you how how much time it takes to make these cinematic universes, let me go back to 1967 when a man named by Gene Deitch had the rights to The Hobbit. Uh, in the early 60s, he attained them, and The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings had not uh, fully become the, the powerhouse it is today. Uh, in the 60s, the hippie culture started reading the books, and uh, they kind of championed uh, the books, and uh, it became even more popular because of that. So the first time we have The Hobbit, uh, this guy, oh, he probably paid a couple thousand dollars. He was from Czechoslovakia. And the deal was he had to make a movie with a certain amount of time or he lost the rights. Well, he made a movie and it's 12 minutes long and it's just some illustrations with the camera kind of going over it. Uh, and it has very little to do with The Hobbit. But he made it uh, and he was able to get the right or sell the rights back to J.R.R. Tolkien uh, for a hundred thousand dollars so uh, he made a nice little profit off of that and thanks to the hippie culture and then uh, you have the 1976 version of The Hobbit from Rankin Bass which is a version that I grew up on uh, it's very well done but because it's Animated for kids, they left out a lot of stuff um, that The Hobbit has in the book. As with any of these productions, they're going to have to leave out something or combine characters or something like that. And then next year, 1978, Ralph Bakshi, which is an animator, took on The Lord of the Rings. And he, he produced a very uh, uh, successful version, but it did not have the whole, it was not the whole Lord of the Rings. Uh, he ran out of funds, out of time. Uh, it was successful, but it did not generate a sequel to, to that, to finish up the story that the fans wanted. And it used a technique that uh, uh, has been used a lot, but he really used it for a lot of the crowd scenes. And I believe it was retrospective? Rotoscoping. Rotoscoping, that's what it was. Where they recorded regular footage and they would have a the animators go over it, right? Right. They 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 have the footage, they, they have some guys running around in a field act like they're fighting, and then they give the image to animators uh, who will draw over that and, and you know, colorize it or whatever they were doing to it. Uh, but that is they get realistic motion that they use for all the battle scenes. So they didn't have to animate in the literal sense where you're drawing every character. You're tracing every character. It leaves a little uh, time to do other things. Uh, it's still pretty, all animation is hard. Uh, rotoscoping is hard. Uh, it just give it saves a little time for, for the production. Uh, and speaking of that film, 1978, I have two of the cells from that, that film, one of Frodo, one of Samwise, uh, which were uh, done, and they were, they were production cells, and I 
bought them at an auction. And I got them, they were kind of uh, sandwiched together, and when you tried to take them apart, they started to peel the paint. Uh, cells are painted, and I didn't want to do that, so I just left them as is. I drew a little background for them, put them in a frame, and it's hanging on my wall now. So I have uh, a tiny little connection to the cinematic viewers. And cinematic viewers take a lot, again, like a lot of time to make, and they had, need to have like very specific elements in them for it to work. Like, for instance, they need to have interesting characters. Well, for example, the Marvel ones, those were really interesting characters. They're really entertaining for the audience to watch in every single movie or even a slight cameo. And having interesting characters will want the viewer to know what happens to them next and thus watch the sequels and other films to find out what happens. And another aspect is don't have it connect to the movies too often. Um, Tom Cruise's The Mummy failed at this and have it set up too much and thus barely focused on the plot, which ruined the movie. Marvel Universe, they decided to, uh, at the end, the post credits, they would introduce them, uh, kind of set up for the next movie or, or, you know, two movies down the way. That way they didn't fall into the trap of putting a lot of that in the movie itself. They left it as kind of Easter eggs for people to find if they sat through the, the credits. Right. And thus you thus the audience get thus the audience gets to see what movie that they wanted to see and thus not like a setup or a sizzle reel. And another aspect is don't always listen to fans because the fans may know the original source material, they may have good ideas but they always do, but they may not because they don't know what you're trying to do. They don't know what has to go in order for it to work. And like for instance, a lot of people complained about the story for Infinity War wasn't exactly on par with the original comic story. But if we did get the original comic story, it would just be a bit of a romantic movie because the original story for Infinity War was Thanos trying to impress death. Yeah, death in, in the cinematic universe is a, 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 a godlike being that he was trying to impress. It was just, you know, kind of acting like a goofy teenager. Right. And another aspect is always start off with a good one, like how the Marvel started off with Iron Man. They poured a lot of work into that and writing, which got us the funny action comedy which many people will know on a whim all you have to do is just say Iron Man and they'll know what you're talking about and another aspect is keep track of the film logic in the shared universe like for instance if you have one thing do the other and another movie say something else that doesn't correlate with that that is that will just be complex and thus hard to keep track and ruin the overall logic of the universe and thus becomes more difficult to understand the story with elements that you would take into effect if that stuff were to happen. Mm -hmm. And the final aspect of a cinematic universe being good is every film in the shared universe needs to be unique enough to stand apart but just feel integral to the overall story. Like, for instance, um, Doctor Strange was really unique enough to stand out in its visual story and character, but it was still important to the overall Marvel storyline because it introduced us to magic for the Marvel Universe, which would become a reoccurring thing throughout the movies. And that goes to show you uh, that they set up Doctor Strange, and he does come in and cameos in some of the subsequent movies. Uh, but it takes a long time to create these universes. Uh, my example with The Hobbit, that was start of 67, and then we had the, the uh, Peter Jackson films in the early 2000s, and you said there was a new series yeah. uh, gonna be on- Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. 
uh, in the Marvel Universe, you know, they've had uh, TV shows, uh, Fantastic Four, Amazing Spider-Man in the 60s. They had live action Spider-Man in the 70s. Uh, there was supposed to be a movie in the late 80s, early 2000s, Fantastic Four. And it was a similar uh, thing with The Hobbit that a guy had the rights to it and he was going to lose the rights if he didn't produce a movie. They produced a movie. They brought in the, the B King, uh, B movie king, uh, Roger Corman, who makes movies quickly and under budget and on time. And uh, at the very end, when they're about to release it, somebody from Marvel or the Marvel uh, Studios at that point didn't want that to get out, so they uh, basically uh, paid for the movie to keep it out of public view, uh, but now you can see bootlegs of it on YouTube and Daily Motion. but uh, that just goes to show you that they've been working on these things for a long, long time. It doesn't just happen like that. Uh, there have been starts and stops for the last 30 years, and uh, you know, as long as they keep making money, they're going to keep producing these, and I just read today that uh, uh, the guy who played Daredevil on the TV series is going to be the Daredevil in the MCU. So that's all for me. Thanks for listening. Remember your childhood memories where you discovered the magic of nature, like looking up at the stars or chasing fireflies. Help ensure your child gets those same experiences. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest or park near you. And discover other cool things to do when you go, like fishing, biking, or even camping. Visit discovertheforest.org. Hi, I'm Logan Palmer, talking about the animals that we are glad they're extinct. The world had giant beasts roaming the land. Not just dinosaurs, but beasts bigger, badder, and scarier that suffered the same fate. The shirt-faced bear. Don't let the name fool you. This bear was heavier than a rhino and 50% bigger than a polar bear. It had to eat 35 pounds of meat per day with a super sense, sense of smell, fangs pointed in different ways, strong enough to rip a man apart in one bite, and gladly wiped out by the hands of man. The terror bird. With a name like that, don't joke around. After the dinos went extinct, terror birds was the top predator in South America. In early ice age, grew to 10 feet tall with T-Rex-like feet and hook-like beak. Can, can break any bone with one bite, with a big head and a strong body using, sing for, using it like a battering ram. If that was scary enough, there were 17 kinds of them. A Pally Belladon. May not be a meat eater like the rest, but there were reasons why they were scary. Let's say an elephant's trunk was a giant powerful shovel for a mouth. Not used as a weapon, but as a tool that can hurt nature by eating the grass and trees too much. No prey animals can live with them around. Titanoboa. After f around 50 feet long, this snake holds the record for being the biggest snake to live. Only living around in the swamps of South America. Like most snakes today, they would ambush anything it can find and wrap around to crutch it. And swallow it whole, mostly on crocodiles. Dunkleosaurus. What's scarier than a shark with many teeth? What about a giant fish with sharp armor-like teeth before dinosaurs even walked the land? These fish got its nickname, the Age of Fish, with jaws that can crush and eat anything, and I mean anything. Sharpening its teeth just like biting Ding it and making any predator from the sea can make a run for Make a swim for their money. Signing off. And this is Logan Palmer signing off. 
Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tim, and I'm talking about why kindness matters here with Elena. So, I'm just going to get straight into it. Why do you think kindness matters? Well, there are a lot of reasons kindness matters. Um, one of the biggest ones is, is that you don't know what somebody else is going through. Um, they can have trauma, uh, PTSD, um, they can be autistic, or have another social disorder that makes it difficult for them to understand um, aggression and other emotions. So um, being kind and being patient with those kinds of people really does help with a lot of things in society. A lot of misinterpretation of what some people say as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just common decency too. Just yeah. Just uh, saying kind things to somebody, yeah. even if you don't even know them. That so should just be a required social skill, like an un, an unspoken law, in my in my opinion. So, uh, what do you think is lacking today? So many reasons. So so many reasons. Um, all of that can be just tied into a general lack of empathy or caring. A lot of uh, opinions. Opinions yeah. being. Yes. Express those, those getting thrown around, and oh, those can just not be fun to deal with. A lot of people who lack the ability to accept that other people have different opinions on things. Yeah, and uh, I I had a situation online uh, a while ago where somebody had made a comment about. Uh, disclosed topic and said that there was science to back it when there was science that actually opposed it and I had replied to that comment directly saying okay here's here's three scientific studies that disprove you can I see yours I've never gotten a reply from the person that made oh, the no. comment but there were a whole bunch of people that like came at me for saying that and I was like okay but where's where's your evidence I I have evidence this is this is formatted in a way that you would actually write a college essay which is where I got the sources from one of my college writing essays from last year and nobody would give me any resources outside of like saying oh it's against my belief I'm like okay but I specifically asked that you ignored that because it says there's science to back this. There's, there's no science. Here's the science that disproves you, but where's, where's your science? And nobody, there were, there were two people that actually like had a conversation with me. Like they weren't just, oh, you're wrong, you're stupid, you you don't know what you're talking about. They were like, okay, no, 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 explain this to me. And we had a conversation. They explained their side. I explained my side. Uh, there was a little bit of passion, passive aggression, because of course we were both passionate about what we were talking about. But we had a very civil conversation. And at the end of the conversation, we actually both thanked one another for being civil and had like a little mini conversation on the side about how that just doesn't happen anymore. So a lot of uh, civil arguments would be a lot better than most of the arguments today. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing I want to bring up is the lack of acceptance to change, how little people are and willing to accept that somebody's different than them. Yeah. Whether it be uh, they like a different thing, they support a different thing, or they themselves are different. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's kind of where the argument online that I got into came from. Because
was it was a belief system that said or that was inferred to say that this thing was wrong whenever technically there's nothing in the uh, the scripture of that belief that says that that thing is wrong <laughs> just you can infer what I'm talking about from Quite. there yeah. Uh, another thing I want to bring up, uh, why it would be lacking today is, um, and this is a, a big factor of the problems, is uh, forcing your ideas on other people and forcing your opinions. How um, people feel like they need to go out of their way to go stand somewhere or um, a particular religious group, per se, comes knocking on people's houses. Mm -hmm. um, Jehovah Witness, anyone? Uh... Not that I have a problem with their religion under any yeah, means. Yeah, no, 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 no. They, they can do that. Just yeah. leave me alone. Um, but again, um, for, again, forcing your ideas on other people. And that's for, that's for both sides, too. Um, yeah. For example, yeah, yeah. I, the example I just brought up with uh, Jehovah Witnesses going door to door. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, uh, I remember that you brought this up far earlier when um, I had this discussion kind of in mind. You were talking about uh, LGBTQ people going around whether they're wearing a shirt or a pin versus um, running, running through the street with a rainbow flag over their head, preaching sec preaching um, homosexuality like it's it's the new best thing and everybody should be doing it and there shouldn't be any straight people like that's that's not okay. And there was that. Uh, straight up just wrong to like vandalizing yeah public public areas uh yeah. there was um a story freedom, freedom of speech is a thing you just need to know where fe freedom of speech becomes oppressive and whenever it whenever it becomes oppressive whenever you're whenever anyone on any side with any opinion is making any statement that makes it seem like okay this is the only thing you can do. You're immediately in the wrong. I don't care who you are, how pure your intentions are, you're immediately in the wrong. Because again, uh, all, hark all harks back down to is you're forcing your ideas on people and that's yeah. not right. Yeah. Again, opinion, like opinion is an inalienable right. Nobody has the right to tell you what your opinion should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so move on to the next thing. How can we fix it? It's it's such a simple thing. It's such a simple thing. It's a simple Just, thing that a lot of people can't grasp the yeah. ability to do. Yeah. If we teach our kids to do this, we teach children to do this, and children get it better than most adults. We can't judge. You're not you're not supposed to like immediately judge someone. And the whole the whole uh, way that we could fix it that we that you said was really easy is just pure acceptance. Whether yeah, you know, if you're an atheist um, yeah. and you don't you don't like religion or you don't like religious people, don't go out of your way to harass a religious person. And then same thing for a religious person to an atheist. Yeah. Don't go out of your way to preach to an atheist. Yeah, 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 yeah. like just. The acceptance that people are different than you and the acknowledgement of their existence is really all we kind of need. Just the acknowledgement and the acceptance that people are going to be different than you and they're not going to agree with you. That's, that's what we need. But then you have, then you have people out there, you, you know the type of people I'm talking about, uh, who are just like, oh no, nobody can be, nobody can be different than me. That's a sin. That's that's illegal. You can't do that because because I say you can't, and they just they act like they're queens and kings and royalty of the world, and they're just they're not. And a lot just, of it um, depends on where you go too, whether you're. Uh, it be yeah. you could be in North America where a majority of people I would say are accepting, uh, or you could be somewhere as 
as deep down as the Middle East where a lot of ideas are straightforward. You have to be like this or you're dead. Yeah. You're going to be executed. Yeah. So again, it all depends on where, where you are, where you're from, your background. But just a general idea of um, being open to new ideas, being open, being accepting, and just general, for lack of a better term, peace. Yeah. Uh, peace will never fully be it will ever fully be a thing because there will always be problems in the world no matter yeah. where you go. Um, but it, it is a goal we can work towards. It it's is something that's within graphs, but we can't perfect it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for, bringing, for coming onto the show and discussing with me about a, a topic as sensitive as kindness. Um, yeah. Which shouldn't be a sensitive topic in my humble opinion. A lot of people will take it differently. Uh, let's hope that you listeners out there uh, go out and sh- at least show some kindness to some people. Uh, but that, yeah, that's all I have for today. Yeah. Okay. And that's all for me, Tim Meyer out. Driver, personal shopper, financial manager, nurse, and daughter. At the ARP, they understand the many roles characters play. That's why they created ARP.org slash caregiving. It is an online resource center that connects you with experts and other caregivers. Together, we can better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Visit ARP.org slash caregiving to learn more. Brought to you by ARP and the Ad Council. Hello, I'm Justin Wingeter, and I'm today I'm going to be talking about luxury, luxury watches. Watches have been huge staples in cultures and society for uh, a long time, since the ancient times and then to the present right now. But, uh, back then, they were mainly used to tell time because back then um, uh, it could tell when your crops would run out of sunlight um, or it could also determine the temperatures like when the sun would rise and when the sun uh, would set, which would determine what clothes you needed to wear to survive. So it was a vital part um, to survival. Um, but as, um, as time went on, it was more into of a status and more of fashion than an actual tool. So... The first watch I want to get into is a pocket watch. We're not going to go over um, clocks because clocks were made before watches, but I just want to focus on the watches. So the rise of the pocket watch began to grow um, um, uh, during the 1500s. The first wa- pocket watch was made in 1510 by name by a, by a man named Peter Henlon invented the first watch. It was a pretty lofty three-inch circular watch. It was attached to a chain that customers could wear around their necks or they could wear it in their pocket as well. It wasn't the best watch ever made, and I didn't really expect it to be, but it started a long road of success for watches and watchmakers um, later on in the future. So during the Industrial Revolution, Business was booming. There was numerous amounts of jobs, lots of wealth going around, and in simple terms, a lot of stuff was getting done, which gave the mo- the economy so much ex- success. So this is where watches came, um, came back into play. Pocket watches were a big thing once again. And it, um, watches back then kind of showed that you were busy and you were um, uh you were providing towards the success of the economy, and it showed the success for you as well. And uh, this was the first time it was really seen as a status symbol to have a watch. Uh, so then came your first wrist watches, and this was the beginning of a huge leg- legacy for a watchmaking company by the name of Rolex. Um, the in 1923 they um, uh, wrote a rolled out the Rolex Oyster. It did really well. It was the first of its kind to offer water and dust resistant and it um, launched the name of Rolex um, far out and it ever since then Rolex has been pumping out classes and really 
classics and has really been making a name for itself. Um, they almo- they also made great names like the Submariner watch and the Date Just watch as well. Uh, and it really and Rolex is really the kind of the first worldwide known luxury watch and paved the way for other luxury watch companies. So um, we're going to be talking about the other companies first. So you got your Audemars Piguet's. Uh, they started being produced around the time Rolex was too. The main difference in the Piguet is they're in an octagon shape, as the Rolex is in a si- si- circular shape. You got other brands like Cartier. They're more known for their clothing, fashion, and stuff like that. Um, but I guess they tried one day to have their to put their hand into a watch ranking, and they've made a name for themselves. Uh, you also have Patek Philippe's, which are a very old company as well, but um, have consi- consistently pumped out classics as well, like your Rolex and Otto Mars. Um, and then you have your Richard Millies. These are a bit newer. Um, they have also made a name for themselves for how complex their watches are. So if you're for looking for a budget to go on your um, watches, I'm going to be giving uh, which watches can go for best for the um, for your money. So my first is the $500 to $10,000 range. Um, for um, under $1,000, you can get nice pieces like um, from Belubas or Citizens, they make a good-looking watch for a very cheap price. Um, for a hundred thousand to ten thousand, uh, probably check out the Omega watch collection. Um, they stay in like the low single-digit thousand range, and they produce a very well-made product. And you can also find Rolexes in there, but they're like your more low-level Rolexes um, that the company likes to produce a lot of. So now you have your twenty thousand to fifty thousand dollar range. There's a Rolex. These are your more I- more entry level Rolexes. You also have a Cartier that can go in these pre- uh, apply uh, into this range. Also Audemars and Patek Philippe's, and these are very well made. Sometimes the price can rise with accessories, but uh, with wa- uh, the diamond with diamonds or special gems on it, but these aren't like your rare diamonds or gems, uh, just like entry level diamonds and stuff. And next for your um, uh, hundred thousand to a million dollar range, these watches are the best of the best. They are really made highly complex uh, watches. They have special gems or rare diamonds on them as well. Your brands include Patek gaze sometimes Cartier and Rolex now these companies do produce a l- good amount of these but their price comes from the materials that they are made out of and how long it takes uh, them as well because they do take a, um, some time to make um, and s- you have to be somewhat pretty wealthy to buy these watches now for your half a million to a million dollar watches uh, you got the Richard Mill. You can have Rolex, Patek, Spigays. But Richard Mill likes to pump consistent watches out at these prices. Um, the reason for that is the complexes, complexion, uh, complexion <laughs> in the watches. And also the material, the material they are made out of, they use the rarest metals um, and stuff like that. And you have to have a high... S- wealth status to afford these because they are very pricey some people go out all out on watches and they're so wealthy they can just blow away their money and some will buy watches worth up to 20 to 50 million dollars which have like your rarest gems you can ever find on earth or and metals as well um nowadays watches really um tell how big your status is than actually being a tool. They still can be a tool, but they really show your status. Um, And the bigger your status, um, the bigger your watch, I guess. Um, (laughs) So watches have changed drastically over time, and I believe they still will later on in the future, only getting bigger and bigger on the ways they are made and used. And that's all for me. Thank you.
Did you know that motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death in children ages 1 to 13, and that the fatality rate could be reduced by half if the correct car seat was always used? Three out of four kids are not as secure in the car as they should be because their car seats are not being used correctly. By visiting safecar.gov slash the right seat, parents and caregivers can find out what the right car seat for their child's age and size is. Be sure you're sure. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Hi, my name is Michael Moses. Today I am here by myself at the Alchemist Show. And today I'm talking about new sodas in the soda series part. This is part two. And the first one is Mountain Dew, my favorite. And started year 1940, originated in the USA. Flavors. Original, Captain Free, Code Red, Live Wire, Pitch Black, Discontinued, Baja Blast, Citrus, Cherry, Voltage, Real Sugar, White Owl, Electric Apple, Soul Flare, Spike Lemonade, Ice, which is Discontinued, Berry Monsoon, a Sam's Club Exclusive, Ice Cherry, which is Discontinued again, Merry Mashup, Limited, Sweet Lightning, KFC Exclusive, Voodoo, 1, 2, and 3, uh, Frostbite, Atomic Blue, Come and Go, and Sheets Exclusive, Maui Burst, Southern Shock, Spark, Major Melon, Baja Punch, Baja Flash, Gauzy Citrus Strawberry, Cake Mash, Thrash Apple, Uproar, Gingerbread Snap, in the Kickstart Series, Rise Energy Series, and Cherry, Regionally Discontinued, and etc. Tab, Start Year. 1963, in year 2020. Regular and diet are the flavors originating in the USA. Surge, start year, 1997, first run in the year 2003, it's revival 2014. Only had one flavor, which is Surge. Mellow Yellow, start year, 1979. Flavors, original, cherry, zero, melon 2003, peach slash afterglow, orange, Great Discontinued, and Lame Me, originated in the USA. Sprite, start year, 1961. Flavors are original, zero sugar, lemon lime herb, recharge, ice, remix, tropical, super lemon, on fire, remix, berry clear, remix, araba, jam, 3G duo, green, stevia formula, cranberry, Cranberry Zero, Six Mix, Blast, Tropical, Cucumber, Cucumber Zero, Cherry Zero, Cherry Zero, Mixed Tropical Berry, Fiber Plus, Zero Lemon and Mint, 40% of less sugar, Ginger, and Ginger Zero. Originated in USA. Bubbly. Bubbly originated in USA. The start year is 2018, and the flavors are lime, grapefruit, strawberry, orange, lemon, cherry, apple, mango, blackberry, peach, raspberry, cranberry, the bounce series, and the soda stream drops. Now, this soda is unfamiliar to people, but culture pop, start year, 2020. Flavors are ginger, lemon, and turmeric. Orange, mango, chili, and lime, wild berry, and peppercorn, pink, grapefruit, and ginger, and juvenile, and watermelon, lime, and rosemary. Resonated in USA as well. May I well, or I don't know how you say it, but start of year 2020, flavors strawberry, ginger with hibiscus, pear lime with green tea, pineapple, mango with a turmeric, and raspberry. Cucumber with black currant and originated in the USA. Come up on ninth one, could have been the top nine, but today is the top eight new sodas. This is Michael Moses and signing off of the Alchemist Show. Did you know that motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death in? The Alchemist Show.